Thank you, uh, Airdex, for inviting me here. It's really great to be with uh, Nathan, Nathan Radcliffe um, from New York. I'm from Toronto. Uh, I, I, I think Nathan is really what I look at as sort of the, you know, the emerging, not even emerging, he's already here. Uh, superstar in glaucoma, uh, young guy with a lot of great ideas. I used to be there one day, so I look at him with envy as far as his great potential and uh, really a great way to uh, you know, conceptualize uh, important concepts in glaucoma, surgical, diagnostic, lasers. Uh, so I'm really privileged to be with him here today. And um, I mean, we're both really excited about uh, how we're kind of revisiting using glaucoma lasers uh, you know, in our management of patients. I mean, we've seen so much improvement in diagnostics in, uh, in surgical treatments and medications. And lasers, we had some, you know, some boom times and it's been a little bit of quiet. So I'm really pleased that you know, we've got some new things to work with. And uh, I think we might say some, share some ideas that maybe not as conventional. So I'm gonna have, uh, we're gonna have Nathan actually start off and we're gonna have very much a conversation, maybe a few uh, arm wrestles if we need to, uh, make it a bit interactive and we hope we get some questions and answers from, uh, or questions from you guys. So I'll hand it over to Nathan. Thank you, Ike, for that wonderful introduction. And Joan and Iridex, thank you for having us. Uh, and it, it's an honor to be here talking about lasers. Uh, Ike, I remember you speaking uh, about minimally invasive glaucoma surgery uh, a few years back, and you mentioned the gap. The gap between our safe eye drop therapies and these more invasive, but yet also more efficacious surgical therapies. And this is all about filling in the gaps. Mm -hmm. And it's been exciting uh, to think about ways to do it. And it's a pleasure to be here with you today, kind of talking about some new options that we have. And we'll cover uh, two different options that sort of cover that gap from two different sides. Um, but I'll start with the patient. And uh, Ike and I wanted to keep this uh, conversational. And uh, so here we have a patient. It's a 58-year-old myopic man. ocular hypertension, using latanoprost, and it admits that he forgets sometimes. And he's a great glaucoma patient because you can immediately see the difference between his disease severity and his functional impairment, which is he's got a good bit of optic neuropathy, as you can see with all the red on the cirrus. It's not myopia, I assure you, and I'll show you how I know that, but a full field. So you've got to make sure that your therapy doesn't turn him from an asymptomatic patient into a symptomatic patient. Um, here's how I know he's got something going on is because while he's taking his latanoprost, his nerve went from looking like this to looking like this. And uh, this is some of the fun technology I've played around with where we've aligned two photographs that were taken several years apart, flipping back and forth, and you see that his optic neuropathy has progressed. So how are you going to approach this type of patient? As I said, he's taking latanoprost, his pressure's borderline, and he's forgetful with his drops, full field, but some real disease. Well, I mean, you know, Nathan does some cool work with this Flickr uh, disc uh, photography, which I think is neat to show the progression. And this is a problem. You know, we get patients drops and we don't know what happens when we don't see them in the office. And here we happen to actually get a history that uh, this chap is not following his uh, medications, which is a real problem for whatever reason. You know, I, I envision the day one day where we don't use drops. I mean, maybe it's a bit of a dream, but that's kind of my dream. Because I think drops, for maybe for the, except for the odd patient, are very difficult. And I won't go through that detail. But here, clearly, something needs to be done. And... Um, I will often actually at least discuss laser trabecoplasty when I'm starting a patient on medications, just to have it in there. I don't always rush to primary therapy, although if I'm really concerned or a patient is really keen on a non-medicine alternative, I, I, will, I, will, I will offer primary, I don't know about you, Nathan, but yep. I, I will offer primary therapy. But in this case, you know, this is a great, this is a perfect example. The reason it's up here, of course, is for that reason that, you know, going through the whole rummer roll again, circle of medication use is probably not gonna, you know, achieve the result we want. We have progression. It's a really an ideal situation to consider doing laser trabecoplasty, getting him down to a better target. I think for him, yeah. he would need a target that would be down into the, into the teens. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I agree completely with all those things. Setting the stage for the trabeculoplasty, maybe years before you're gonna need it, is I think also the key. Patients sometimes can have reluctance or apprehension, but if you connect it to their narrative, reminding him that this isn't uh, you know, something we're doing um, because it's a last ditch effort, but rather this is something I'm doing to address a problem you're having, which is forgetfulness. And you know, we all are making choices. You might want to choose uh, a trabeculoplasty. Uh, one of the things Ike and I are going to try not to do is tell you things that you already know. Uh, and so we have slides up here. They've got all the information on things like trabeculoplasty. I think we know the model. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit uh, about a different kind of trabeculoplasty. Uh, which is micro, uh, micropulse uh, laser trabeculoplasty. Um, 
and I guess I'll go into a little bit about what micropulse technology is and uh, how it works. So uh, if you think back to argon laser trabeculoplasty, you have a thermal laser that's delivered uh, in a continuous fashion. And uh, if, if you've performed argon laser trabeculoplasty, you see a direct thermal effect with contraction of tissue as you're applying the laser. Uh, the concept of micropulse, I'm going to skip ahead here, is to break that continuous laser up into little envelopes, um, you know, one microsecond uh, envelopes, where the, liver, uh, the laser delivers the energy and then actually allows a cooling period and then picks back up. The analogy I've used is waving your hand over a candle as opposed to just holding your hand over a flame. It's that, that thermal spread that creates the heat and the damage. You can deliver the same amount of time over that flame if you just break it up and allow some cooling. If and someone has a lighter, I can actually show, <laughs> Nate will show how this, how this works. Yeah, we uh, <laughs> were doing some of that at the uh, bar last <laughs> night, but um, maybe not now. Uh, so the, this concept of the duty cycle refers to what percentage of the cycle is the laser delivering um, energy versus resting. And you can set that duty cycle, but a 31% duty cycle would be a half a millisecond on and 1.1 milliseconds off. Um, and so, um, and I think the other way to look at it too, I mean, I think the candle analogy is great. Obviously an Elton John fan, right, Candle Lewin, but, but uh, you know, I, I, even FACO, right? I mean, FACO, we're all, you know, hyper-pulsing uh, our, you know, our, our power delivery. And we're changing our duty cycle depending on density of the lens. And we know the savings we have with thermal energy and efficiency as far as at the FACO tip. So I think this is, I mean, this is a long time coming actually. I'm, su I'm actually surprised it hasn't been something that we haven't been doing, you know, longer than we are. Uh, where we're actually taking advantage of the benefit of laser without that thermal damage, the collateral damage to the tissue. Uh, understanding thermal relaxation time of cell structure and, 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 and reaction to, to, uh, to energy. And sa saving the benefit of the laser, but not the collateral damage that we see with that thermal energy. And I'm, I know Nate, I mean, we, you know, we've seen the retina guys take advantage of this. Yep. And I think it's great to see this now into the glaucoma space, so. So uh, I think what I'll actually do here is uh, just sort of show you what this looks like. And uh, we have two examples. One is uh, more of a schematic showing you the spot size. And with Micropulse, we typically use uh, a 300 micron spot size. SLT is more like 400. This has some advantages for me. One that, that comes to mind immediately, and there's actually good evidence for this, are, is laser trabeculoplasty in patients who've already had a laser iridotomy. Uh, and they've had angle opening, but they're still a little narrow. And you, you want to get into the angle, get the trabecular meshwork, but now there's a little bit of a higher risk of hitting other tissue. You could hit on the one side the iris and on the other side the endothelium. And with SLT with a larger uh, beam size, it's uh, a little more tricky. Uh, I've found that the micropulse laser gets in there very nicely into those narrow areas. Yeah, how many have seen uh, PAS after SLT? And well, ALT we know we've seen that, but what about after SLT? Because I, I, I examine some of my patients later on after SLT, and again, I don't, I'm not, we're, we're, SLT has had a role, of course. Yeah. We're trying to differentiate a little bit here, but, but PAS formation. And, I, and certainly, any laser trabeculoplasty has a risk for PAS, uh, but I think that spot size probably helps us get in there a little bit tighter. I think it's, it's a bit of an advantage here. Yeah. And the gentleness with the energy. Uh, and so why don't I just show you, uh, I think we have a video of Ike's uh, performing uh, micropulse uh, laser trabeculoplasty here. Yeah, we, um, we did have a video here. Hopefully, it'll it'll play. Um, you know, is it playing? Oh, okay. There you see it. Great. So, I'm, you know, you're basically seeing the red aiming beam uh, on the video there, and you're seeing that uh, um, placed on the uh, trabecular meshwork. You can see a lot of space in the angle there. It's focused very well, and um, and basically going along here. And we typically. I don't need we'll probably talk a bit about this, but we basically take, you know, essentially, you know, overlapping or, or spots touching each other, so they're side by side. You basically get about 100 spots for 360 degrees. It's a very straightforward approach that we're familiar with with a standard uh, trabeculoplasty. Yeah. yeah, to say the learning curve, if you're already performing trabeculoplasty, is essentially non-existent. You just make sure you're straight on your settings, uh, and I'll go over those in a minute. Uh, suffice it to say that using this technique, uh, they've evaluated the trabecular meshwork, with electron microscopy and found no discernible uh, difference or no evidence of any damage, which is uh, you know, precisely what you would expect. And while you're applying the laser, you see no tissue effect. And you know, we know with argon laser, you'll see contraction. With SLT, you can see champagne bubbles. Uh, here, 
lasers applied and, uh, and, and you don't see any effect. So um, just a little bit on the settings and then, then I'll compare SLT and MLT a little bit. Uh, different powers have been tried and I'll show you there's a dose response curve which is always a good sign that uh, you found a therapy that, that is efficacious. Um, currently most of us are using about a thousand milliwatts. I've done a lot with seven or eight hundred as well. Uh, spot size 300 microns. You're using an exposure duration of 300 milliseconds uh, and again that is uh, many many um, pulses of laser with uh, interruption. We use a duty cycle of 15 percent um, so that's a pretty small proportion of the overall exposure that the laser's firing and we'll typically treat 360 degrees. So those, are that, those of you that are into math, and I mean, I, I remember when I programmed my FACO machine, I would really diligently figure out how many seconds I'm on and off. So that's basically 300 milliseconds on, 15% duty cycle. That means if you do the math, of course, that's basically a two second pulse duration as far as the actual pulse. Within that pulse, you have 300 milliseconds on and 1.7 uh, seconds or 1700 milliseconds off. Every time you get, a, you get a pulse of energy. So you have more off time than on time 50% on time only, so it's a very short little on time in that individual packet of, of, uh, of delivery. Uh, so this is just a comparison, and I think I can certainly speak for myself, I do both. Um, I do MLT and I do SLT, and you know, so when might you use one versus the other? Uh, that's sort of one part of the story if you have both of them um, sitting in your office. Uh, there are other questions though as well uh, and which make this laser unique which is well if I'm starting a new office and we need an argon laser we want to do some retinal laser we want to do some iridotomies um, can we also provide ourselves the option of micropulse without adding the additional expense of a SLT unit so um, some of some of this is related to practice efficiency uh, and some is related to if you had both and you're in all the ideal settings when would you choose one versus the other um, and the other thing I'll, I'll explain is that in my office anyway, I have this in one of my lanes where I'm seeing patients. Uh, so it's my regular slit lamp, I have the 532 laser there, and I have a little piece that fits on the slit lamp, and so while I'm discussing the laser, I tap it and say this is the laser that you're going to have. And you know, the patient I think is a little anxious about what it might mean, and they see the box sitting there. Uh, I don't have to move the patient, so from a time standpoint, uh, there's a little bit of an uh, uh, advantage there. Um, it's actually quite practical. Um, anyway, looking at MLT versus SLT, 532 uh, nanometers. Have you done any 577 MLT? No, or? not at this point, yeah. no. But okay. I think that's, a, that's an exciting area of, uh, of new development yeah. here. Um, we also have, uh, uh, so again, no, not seeing any thermal effect when you're doing MLT. As I said, you can see uh, champagne bubbles. Uh, they're both repeatable, and I'll show you some evidence uh, where MLT has been performed after other types of uh, laser trabeculoplasty. Um, again, you're not seeing anything post-operatively. Uh, probably for me, the, the single most uh, important distinguishing feature is that an eye after MLT is, and I don't say this a lot, but really, in my experience, 100% quiet. And I mean, you've got to look at the chart to see which eye had the laser. Uh, and this is in your half hour check, um, which, which frankly I think probably isn't necessary uh, after MLT because I've never seen a pressure spike. Uh, and that changes the dynamic for me. Uh, SLT we know has proven efficacy, works very well, but we also know you can have pressure spikes. And for some of these patients on the edge, uh, you're hesitant to press, press their pressure even higher, even if you know that six weeks down the road you'll get a good benefit. But it also has some advantages for the patient management uh, I never use steroids or NSAIDs after the MLT. And I also feel more comfortable beginning the cessation of their glaucoma therapy the day that the MLT is performed. Whereas with SLT, there are a few extra visits as we first make sure there wasn't a spike, then look at their pressure treated, and then look at withdrawing therapy, which, which can be a little bit more complex. Yeah, I would echo what, what exactly what Nate said. And I, uh, you know, we've had some early experiences now, and you know, we've actually had a number of patients where we've done SLT in one eye and MLT in the other eye for patients we treat bilaterally. I, I don't have too much of a problem treating bilaterally if the patient has a relatively yep. good nerve yep. and, uh, and, and, and not a high risk. Uh, pigmented eyes, I'd be a little bit careful, um, but otherwise routine eyes, and we actually, we actually can see the difference uh, with that. I mean, there's no question, and I certainly had some skepticism because uh, you know we certainly were very pleased with SLT, and uh, yep. this isn't necessarily at all an SLT bashing session at all. We have 
you know, two or three assaulted units within our practices, actually, yeah. and, and we do use them. But I'm very intrigued at what were the possibilities of with MLT, what we're yeah. seeing. And I would echo what Nate has said as far, yeah. as, uh, as, far as the treatment there. Yeah. Uh, question for you, Nate, what about with pigmented eyes? I mean, with SLT, we've got to really be careful with yeah. ILP spikes. What has been your experience with like a pigment dispersion eye or someone with a three plus pigmented angle? Yeah. Any settings you know,